Imagine having a puppy. Now, imagine that puppy is a deadly drake soaring around and helping you bring down bad guys. Yeah, I want one too. With Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons has come several new player options, including the new Drake Warden Ranger. And when the subclass was announced, many had hoped that it would serve as a revised boost to the Beastmaster subclass, though it was notably improved quite a bit in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. But we aren't here today to talk about all that. Today we're here to talk about Berlin Blastbeard, the Drake Warden Ranger pirate, and his fire-breathing Drake, Lucy. But hang on, before we get too caught up in theatrics and the flavor of this character, let's go over some specifics of this subclass in plain English. I should mention, however, that I won't be going over most of the base ranger class features in this video, since I do have another one that goes over all that stuff right here. To keep things balanced, I'll be choosing my stats with a quick point buy, but before that, I'll select a hill dwarf as my race. Very inefficient of me, I know but I will be utilizing the optional rule in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything to assign my plus two bonus to dexterity instead of constitution, leaving the plus one in wisdom where it is. We will get some other goodies from our race like dark vision, advantage on saving throws and resistance against poison, proficiency in some weapons we'll already have proficiency in, double proficiency in the history skill when used for the origin of stonework, plus our choice of brewer's supplies, mason's tools, and smith's tools. And the very best part, an extra hit point at every level. Relax, I know some of this stuff won't get used. I just like the flavor of a dwarven pirate with a charred beard covered in soot from explosions triggered by his drake and black powder. If you want to do something different, you're perfectly welcome to do so. Now, for our proficiencies at first level, I'll be choosing survival, nature, and animal handling. Pretty standard options for ranger with animal handling relating to any checks we might have to make with our drake later though most things should be okay to do without a check. It's just in case. As for spells, which we start getting at second level, I won't list everything I'm taking for this build, but you should definitely consider Goodberry, Zephyr Strike, Aid, and Gust of Wind at lower levels. Goodberry is always nice to have between bouts of combat and, in particular, before a long rest, so we can spin any unused spell slots to help heal the party and later, our Drake if necessary. Zephyr Strike will go a long way in helping our maneuverability, attacks, and damage, and it's honestly just a staple in pretty much every ranger that I make. Aid will help keep you, your allies, and your drake alive at lower levels, and it even scales nicely in later levels. And last, you might be questioning my choice of Gust of Wind. This one isn't exactly necessary for every Drake Warden build, but Berlin is a sailor. Take it from me. Wind on command can really come in clutch on the high seas. From speeding up your own vessel to capsizing another, we'll want this in our back pocket. Also at second level, I'll choose the archery fighting style for Berlin. You could easily go for something else here, but I really like the idea of supporting our allies and our drake from the back with a bow or a crossbow. At least, for now. After reaching third level, we'll get to choose our Drake Warden Ranger archetype, and we'll finally get to meet our Drake, Lucy. I've chosen to flavor her as a magical fire drake that Berlin found in a mysterious batch of loot, but it should be noted that there are a lot of options here aside from this one. But let's start at the beginning of our Drake Companion feature that we get here. The ability states that we can magically summon the drake as an action and that it is bound to you, appearing in an unoccupied space within 30 feet of you. It's friendly to you and your companions and obeys your commands without question. When the drake is summoned, you determine its draconic essence from the choices of acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison. This will also determine its damage immunity and the damage of its infused strikes. More on those in just a moment. While I chose to keep Lucy exclusively as a fire drake, you can easily change the draconic essence of yours each time you summon it, giving you the chance to gain a slight advantage depending on the type of creatures that you're facing. As for combat, Lucy will share our initiative, but will take its action directly after us, which is a little different from the Beastmaster. It means that we have a little less versatility when commanding our drake to do something with our bonus action that coincides with our own actions. And if we don't command it, the drake will only take the dodge action, unless 
we're unconscious. In this special case, the drake can actually take any action of its own choice, perhaps giving us a chance to save our own character in a troublesome situation. <laughs> Though, if you die, the drake will vanish, leaving behind anything it was carrying or wearing. The drake will also vanish if it is reduced to zero hit points or if you summon it again. No, you can't have two drakes at the same time, sadly. And once you summon the drake, you can't do it again until you complete a long rest unless you expend a spell slot of first level or higher to do so. Finally, let's take a look at this thing's stat block. Starting out, Lucy will be a small dragon creature with an AC of 14 plus our proficiency bonus and hit points of 5 plus 5 times our ranger level. Notably, it does have a walking speed of 40 feet right out of the gate as well. It'll have a saving throw proficiency in dexterity and wisdom and dark vision up to 60 feet. The drake can use its action to bite another creature with a plus three plus our proficiency bonus to hit for 1d6 plus our proficiency bonus piercing damage. When comparing this damage to what you get with the Beastmaster, I would say this doesn't pack quite as much of a punch, but the real benefit of this drake comes from its reactions using an ability called Infused Strikes. This allows the drake to stack an extra 1d6 damage of its draconic essence whenever another creature within 30 feet of it hits a target with a weapon attack. Though only able to activate this once per turn, chances are it'll get used. And in a way, it's damage that always hits as a result. In my opinion, this already makes the drake a better choice than the Beastmaster, but you're free to disagree in the comments if you'd like. While you're there, feel free to hit subscribe and like the video if you're enjoying this build. Thanks. Another important detail that's easily overlooked in the stat block is that it speaks Draconic, which brings me to our other third level Drake Warden feature, Draconic Gift. This will give us the ability to speak, read, and write Draconic in one other language of our choice, meaning that we'll be able to easily communicate with our Drake. The second language is totally up to you here, depending on what might be useful in your campaign setting and in your party composition. Oh and you'll get Thaumaturgy for free as a ranger spell. <laughs> Neat. Moving right along, we'll take an ability score improvement at fourth level to start maxing out our dexterity score, bringing it to a 19 for now. We'll get an extra attack at fifth level, and then we get Bond of Fang and Scale, our seventh level Drake Warden feature. This, I feel, is where things really start to click into place for our subclass. For starters, Lucy grows to medium size, will gain a flying speed equal to its walking speed, and we'll be able to use her as a mount so long as we're medium or smaller, though we can't use that flying speed if we're mounted. <laughs> At least not yet. I will give some special attention here since there has been some debate about whether or not the wording of this feature allows for your drake to fly with other characters mounted on it. My personal interpretation is... No. <laughs> Sadly, the gotcha here is that by the same logic, you would be the only person that can mount the drake in the first place, and that's actually how I rule it in my games. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry. I'm just covering my bases for the people that like to take advantage of the way rules are written. Getting back to the rest of this feature, our drake will also gain magical fangs that deal an extra 1d6 draconic essence damage when they land a bite attack, and they'll give you resistance against the same chosen damage type. This is fantastic if you have some idea as to what damage types you might be up against. Your drake would be immune and you would be resistant. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you do less damage to the enemy as well. It all sort of plays into the ranger being a wise and well-prepared adventurer. But, uh, my guy just does fire. <laughs> Speaking of fire, we get the chance for another ability score improvement at 8th level, but I'm going to pick out something a little different instead. Here, I'm going to take the gunner feat and pick up a couple of flint pistols, as well as a 20 in dexterity. This feat fits this build so well, allowing us to ignore the loading property of firearms and allowing us to ignore the typical disadvantage of shooting someone within five feet. Now you can choose to forego this feat here if you prefer the range that you get with a longbow and I did just that whenever I used this build in a level 10 one shot for Atmos Seekers channel. The art I had made reflects this choice as well and I ended up picking up the piercer feat instead to make sure that I made the most of every attack I landed. 
It was a ton of fun, so make sure you check that out if you're interested in seeing this build in action. But let's get back to the version of the build in this video. At 11th level, we get our next Drake Warden feature in Drake's Breath. As an action, we can produce a 30-foot cone of damaging breath from ourselves or our Drake, choosing acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison damage, which doesn't have to match our Drake's Draconic Essence. Each creature in the cone must make a dex save against our spell save DC, which is 8 plus our wisdom modifier plus our proficiency bonus, taking 8d6 damage on a failed save or half on a success. The damage does also scale to 10d6 at 15th level, but we can only use this feature once per long rest unless we choose to expend a third level spell slot or higher to use it. This certainly had me drawing some similarities to another third level spell when I read it. But there are some notable differences here, good and bad. Being able to mix and match our resistance and damage is probably the best part about this feature, but its limited range and damage area leaves a bit to be desired. That all said, it's still quite useful, not incredibly overpowered, but useful, and this build is glad to have it. While we're on the subject of spells, let's talk about a few more that you'd probably want to keep an eye on around this point. In particular, Cordon of Arrows, Contra Barrage, and Revivify. Between all of these, you may find one common theme. None of them require concentration. As a ranger, our concentration is vied for quite heavily, so to make room for our favored foe in Zephyr Strike, I chose to be a bit more choosy with this next batch. It also just so happens that most of these spells are pretty on theme for our build. Cordon of Arrows allows us to set a magical trap with four pieces of non-magical ammunition as an action that lasts for eight hours, resulting in a potential dex save when a creature comes within 30 feet of the trap or ends its turn within range, taking 1d6 on a failure. This is great for adding protection to whatever ship we're sailing in case we get boarded. Conjure Barrage carries much of the same flavor wherein we fire a piece of non-magical ammunition into the air and create a 60-foot cone of damage wherein every creature failing a dex save must take 3d8 damage or half on a success. Now most of the time we'll probably choose to use our Drake's Breath instead, but if we need the extra range or if we have a lot of weaker enemies, a 60-foot cone could be a better option. And last, Revivify is just really good. <laughs> no flavor here, really. It's just great for us to have on almost any ranger in case we need it. Of course, water breathing on a pirate certainly has some use as well if you want to consider that one. With so many of our options requiring saving throws at this point, we'll probably want to use our 12th level ability score improvement to boost our wisdom to 18 before moving to our final Drake Warden feature at 15th level called Perfected Bond. This feature will boost the Drake's magical bite damage from an extra 1d6 to an extra 2d6, turn it into a large creature that we can now mount and fly with, and allow you to give yourself or the Drake resistance to an instance of damage as a reaction so long as you're within 30 feet of each other. I absolutely love this last bit since ranger reactions largely go unused and we can do this a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus per long rest. That gives us some great staying power and helps to elevate our drake to something better than anything the Beastmaster has access to. At this point, we're just flying above our enemies with a pair of pistols and a fire-breathing drake that can dish out some extra damage on our attacks and even pack a bit of a punch on their own turn with its bite. At 16th level, I'll choose to max out our wisdom with another ability score improvement, but taking Sharpshooter isn't all that bad an option either. If not here, I'd probably opt to take it later anyway. Notably, Elven Accuracy is also a great choice if you go with an Elf instead of a Dwarf for your race. All you'd have to do is sacrifice a bit of flavor along with your soul as a fun-loving player by admitting that nearly every build is better with Elven Accuracy. After you've made this decision about changing your own alignment, we'll advance to 17th level for our first 5th level spell slot. But choosing a 5th level spell here can be tricky too. On the one hand, Swift Quiver will allow us to attack twice as a bonus action with our pistol without taking the attack action on our turn. So we could conceivably attack and cast Swift Quiver on our first turn, and then cast a spell and attack twice on subsequent turns. This would be a no-brainer, but it 
does eat up our concentration, keeping us from making use of Zephyr Strike as well as our favorite foe ability. On the other hand, we could take something else like Steel Wind Strike or Conjure Volley that doesn't use concentration and just deals decent spell damage to a number of targets as a burst option. I think any of those choices are good options, but I've opted for Swift Quiver on this build, and I have a few reasons for that. Firstly, I feel as though our Drake's Breath already covers us for some burst damage over an area, along with a couple of other spells we already have access to. Secondly, our pistols do 1d10 damage on a hit. Getting an extra one of those each turn is already going to be better than our 1d8 favored foe damage, assuming they both hit. And assuming they don't, there is one other reason that I'll mention a bit later on. That's right, you'll have to watch all the way to the end. <laughs> now, at this point, we reach a bit of a crossroads. In my opinion, continuing with the remainder of this build in Ranger doesn't offer us much else. At least nothing extremely useful for this build. So, as per usual with my characters, we'll try out a little multi-class dip. But what should we choose? Thematically, I think Fighter or Rogue would make the most sense, but what helps us out more mechanically? As crazy as this might sound, I'm going to do a slight dip into both. Admittedly, this will cause us to miss out on our last ability score improvement or feat, but I truly believe that the benefits we get here outweigh the sharpshooter option that I mentioned earlier. So we'll start off with a single level in Rogue for Sneak Attack, Expertise in Sleight of Hand, and Thieves Tools, and Thieves Can't. Berlin is a pirate after all. <laughs> I'm sure you can see where I'm going with all this, but using sneak attack in place of or on top of favored foe really helps to make the most of all these attacks we're going to have with Swift Quiver. Seriously, we just get so much from this dip that it doesn't make sense not to take it. I think you could even make the argument to take this dip earlier in this build if you'd like, but I feel as though reaching 17th level first really gives the most effective results, so we have Swift Quiver, a Flying Mount, and some other great options for spell attacks as soon as possible. And for our last two levels in Fighter, we'll take the Superior Technique fighting style to gain Precision Attack to help us land our attacks and Second Wind for a bit of extra survivability. But what we really want here is Action Surge at second level. While we're only able to use this once per short rest, having an extra chance for 1d10 damage plus our rogue sneak attack or even casting a spell can really come in handy in a pinch. Overall, using Action Surge while having Swift Quiver and being mounted on our Drake flying in the air means that we could slam an enemy with our Drake's Breath followed by three total attacks at 1d10 damage each plus our rogue sneak attack plus our Drake's infused strike damage. And all this while being passively resistant to a damage type, or being resistant to an instance on a reaction, flying around with a 40 foot movement speed, and having some extra defensive options in our back pocket. Berlin Blastbeard is surely a force to be reckoned with, along with his trusty Drake companion. Only the seas they sail upon can be more ruthless, unwieldy, and dangerous. If you want to be a badass like Berlin, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any of our other crazy builds and live play sessions like that one I mentioned we did with Atmoseeker. And with that, until next time, go out there and make some chaos.